Hello everyone, Foxy here, and welcome to Mostly Mental. Last time in this series on combinatorics, we talked about permutations. Today, I'd like to continue in the same vein with a look at the wonderfully named derangements. And to help me out, I called in an expert. So please welcome my partially deranged friend, Joel. Hello. Thank you so much for being here today. It's a pleasure. So, first of all, what's a derangement? Well, to talk about derangements, let's first revisit the idea of a permutation. And here we're going to be thinking about a permutation as handing tests back to students. So, for example, we can hand test one back to student one, test two to student three, test three to student four, and test four to student two. In cycle notation, this is going to be one for test one being handed back to student one. We call this a fixed point because nothing is changing. And for the remaining cycle, that's going to be two, three, four. And that is just saying that test two goes to student three, so two goes to three, three goes to four, and four goes to two. But let's look at a slightly different case. Here we have test one going to student two, test two going to student three, test three going to student four, and test four going to student one. In cycle notation, this is going to be one, two, three, four. Here we have no fixed points, and we call such a permutation without any fixed points a derangement. And if we want to count the number of derangements, we denote that as d sub n. So what's so interesting about derangements? Well, let's just look at what we had before. So the total number of derangements on four element sets, d sub 4, that's equal to 9. Out of the 4 factorial, or 24 possible permutations. So 9 out of 24, or 37.5 percent of these permutations are derangements. So what happens as n gets larger? Well, let's first look at the case where n is equal to 5. So d sub 5 is equal to 44. 5 factorial, that's going to be 120. And 44 out of 120, that's going to be 36.6%. Okay, so we've done four and five, but as it turns out, as we get larger, in general, d sub n over n factorial, this is going to tend towards 36.78%. And as it turns out, this is equal to one over e. That's fascinating. How does e come into all of this? Well, we want to start out with a relationship. So, let's count the number of permutations. So on the one hand, we have n factorial possible permutations. And on the other hand, we can break it up based on the number of fixed points. So let's say we have k fixed points. Well, there are n choose k ways of picking which elements are fixed. And for the remaining elements, they're a derangement because they don't have any fixed points. And there are d sub n minus k ways of doing that. And we want to be summing this up because we don't just have one fixed point or two fixed points. We want to be summing up all possibilities from zero fixed points all the way up through n fixed points. I see factorials and binomial coefficients in there. I assume that means we're throwing exponential generating functions at the problem? Absolutely. So what we first do is we multiply both sides by x to the n over n factorial. So on the left side, we have n factorial, and that will just cancel. But on the right side, we have the sum from k equals 0 to n of n choose k times d sub n minus k times x to the n over n factorial. And now we sum over all n. And at this point, on the left-hand side, you can recognize this as the geometric series, 
one over one minus x. And on the right hand side, we can actually recognize this as the product of two functions. So the first function is the sum over all n of d sub n times x to the n over n factorial. And the second function is the sum over all n of one times x to the n over n factorial. We recognize that this first function is the exponential generating function d of x. And the second function is just the function e to the x. And solving for d of x, we find that is equal to e to the negative x over one minus x. Well, that's cool. So how do we get the derangement numbers out of that? Well, we're looking for d sub n. And that's just going to be the x to the n over n factorial coefficient of d of x. And that is just going to be n factorial times the x to the n coefficient of e to the minus x over 1 minus x. And at this point, we can just expand the geometric series to get n factorial times the x to the n coefficient of 1 plus x plus x squared plus so on and so forth, all times e to the minus x. And now we can distribute the sum, and that's going to be n factorial times the x to the n coefficient of e to the minus x plus the x to the n minus 1 coefficient of e to the minus x plus so on and so forth, all the way until we get to the x to the 0 coefficient of e to the minus x. And this we can just evaluate. That's going to be n factorial times negative 1 to the n over n factorial plus negative 1 to the n minus 1 over n minus 1 factorial, and so on and so forth, all the way until we get up to 1 over 0 factorial. And now we can just reverse the sum and get n factorial times 1 over 0 factorial minus 1 over 1 factorial plus 1 over 2 factorial minus 1 over 3 factorial plus all the way up until we get to the last term, which is going to be negative 1 to the n over n factorial. Huh. And that bit in the parentheses looks an awful lot like the series for 1 over e. Yeah, exactly. So we can write 1 over e as the sum for k greater than or equal to 0 of negative 1 to the k over k factorial. And we can split this up into two terms. So 1 over e is equal to the sum from k equals 0 to n of negative 1 to the k over k factorial plus the remainder, which is going to be the sum for k greater than or equal to n plus 1 of negative 1 to the k over k factorial. And then I'm just going to multiply both sides by n factorial. And what we see is this first term over here, this is just going to be d sub n. And the second term, well, as it turns out, the second term is really small. Specifically, this is less than 1 half. So what that means is d sub n is actually equal to the nearest integer to n factorial over e. That's really cool. So where can we go from there? Well, let's revisit the formula and let's plug in d sub n minus 1 and see what happens. So this is equal to n minus 1 factorial times 1 over 0 factorial minus 1 over 1 factorial all the way up until we get to negative 1 to the n minus 1 over n minus 1 factorial. And this looks very similar to what we had up above. So let's just make it look even more similar. Let's multiply both sides by n. So we have n times d sub n minus 1 
is equal to n factorial times 1 over 0 factorial minus 1 over 1 factorial all the way up until we get to negative 1 to the n minus 1 over n minus 1 factorial. And now we see that this looks exactly like the first part of our original formula up above. The only thing we're missing is this last term. So let's just plug it in. And we get d sub n is equal to n times d sub n minus 1 plus our missing term. This is going to be n factorial times negative 1 to the n over n factorial. And these cancel, leaving us with our formula d sub n equals n times d sub n minus 1 plus negative 1 to the n. That's a pretty simple formula. That usually means there's a nice combinatorial proof. I'm told you wrote the paper on the subject? Yeah, so actually when I was taking a combinatorics class in my undergrad, one of my professors mentioned offhandedly that there was no well-known combinatorial proof for this. So I took that as a challenge and I ended up coming up with something. Very cool. So walk me through this. What are we counting here? Well, on one side, we're counting the number of derangements. And on the other side, we're counting the number of permutations with one fixed point. And both of these are of n element sets. And we have this one element here, which is just could be on either side, depending on whether we have an even number of elements or an odd number of elements. And what we're doing is we're creating a perfect mapping between these two sets, one set of derangements and one set of permutations with a single fixed point. And when we do this, we notice that either we have one extra permutation with a single fixed point, or we end up with one extra derangement. We won't be able to quite get this perfect mapping. OK, now let's talk specifics. What does this correspondence actually look like? So our goal is to create a map that takes a derangement and outputs a permutation with a fixed point and something which does the opposite. So let's just start with a derangement such as the one pictured here. And you want to create a fixed point. So let's just look at where this first element is pointing. OK, it's pointing there. So let's just make that our fixed point. And now, well, this isn't a permutation because we have two elements pointing here and no elements pointing here. So we'll fix that by creating this arrow. And now we have a permutation with a single fixed point. So that's all well and good. So let's just look at how this correspondence actually looks like for this. And we saw going in this direction. But now let's look at the reverse. So we have this fixed point. So let's just point our first element at it. So we want to point this here. And that corresponds to this arrow. And then in order to fill in the remaining hole, we just add this arrow. OK, so where does this go wrong? Well, let's look at an example. Let's look at this particular derangement. And what we see here is we have our first element pointing to some element. And that element is pointing back to our first element. And what happens in this particular case when we apply our algorithm, first we create our fixed point where, where our element was pointing. So we create this fixed point. And we add in our other arrow, which is over here. And our final result has two fixed points. This isn't quite what we wanted. But if you make a clever observation over here, this is just a permutation with a single fixed point. And we can create a derangement out of that. So what we do is we apply our algorithm over there. And once we're done with our algorithm, what we end up with is a permutation with a single fixed point. Notably, this is a permutation where our first element is fixed. And if you want to reverse this, well, we just do the exact same thing. We note that this is a, this is a derangement. And we know how to create a permutation with a single fixed point there. We just do our algorithm. And once we do that, now we have this permutation with two fixed points. But we just uncross these or we just cross these two arrows 
and we're good. Back to our derangement. So will this always get to a permutation with one fixed point eventually? Unfortunately, not quite. So this is where that off by one thing we talked about earlier comes in, is if we start out with this particular permutation, when we apply our algorithm, we'll always have an even number of fixed points, so we'll never be able to get to our single fixed point since one is odd. And similarly, in this particular case down here, when n is odd, well, we have this one fixed point at the beginning, and when we apply our algorithm, we'll always have an odd number of fixed points and never getting down to zero, which is what we want for a derangement. And putting it all together, we have this correspondence tells us that d sub n is n d sub n minus one plus or minus one, or plus negative one to the n, depending on whether n is even or odd. That's a very elegant proof. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. I've put a link to Joel's original paper in the description below. It's a somewhat different argument from the one we've presented here, and I think it's worth checking out if you've got the time. And if you like this interview format or you want to see more like it, please let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear from you. Next time, I'll take a step away from counting and talk a bit about approximations, specifically Sterling's formula for the factorial function. I hope you'll join me for that. Thank you for watching. I hope to see you again soon.